Welcome to the Notre Dame Global London Gateway. Um, my name is Ashley Beck and I'm the Programme Director of the Master of Arts Programme in Catholic Social Teaching. Uh, this lecture this evening is in part session number eight of the second module of this degree, uh, Catholic Social Teaching Applied. And we're very grateful to Dr. Bruton for coming um, from Dublin to lead this session this evening. We decided to make it a public lecture and we're very grateful to all of you for coming. Our thanks too to Father Jim Lees, to Bridget Keating and the authorities here at the Notre Dame London Gateway um, for welcoming us not only this evening but for all the teaching of this module and all of our other modules in our Master of Arts programme. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Tom Tugendhat, Member of Parliament for Tunbridge and Morling and Chair of the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee who's agreed to chair this evening. Tom, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I, I didn't know this was part of a piece of coursework. If I'd known, I'd have brought my cheat sheet and uh, asked for a degree at the end of it, Francis. How's about it? Uh, Father Beck, thank you very much for the privilege of uh, allowing me to introduce tonight's speaker. It's a huge uh, privilege to uh, introduce Nair Tishuk, uh, particularly one with such a distinguished uh, history. It's also a, a fantastic privilege to be here in Notre Dame and to be speaking on behalf of uh, St. Mary's Catholic University. Now, John Bruton has been in public life a little bit longer than um, I've been in life, and, uh, <laughs> and this July will be uh, 50 years since he was elected to the Doyle uh, at only 22, um, and it, since then he has served in any number of different ministries, including, uh, of course, being Taoiseach Prime Minister of Ireland in 1994. And he made amazing reforms in uh, Ireland in the industry brief, which then led to uh, the famous Celtic tiger uh, that we saw raw uh, throughout the late 90s and early noughties. Uh, not that that's a reference to his uh, leadership, of course. <laughs> and since then, uh, the, uh, sadly, the, uh, the voters were unappreciative. I'm aware of this uh, emotion and, uh, and were unkind enough not to reward you with a second term. But you then served on the convention that was designed to bring the EU closer to its citizens through a constitution. And though the, that was a worthy aim, uh, it didn't quite carry in the same way in the UK as, uh, as, as many people would have hoped. And uh, later, taking on the EU's mantle in Washington, you were able to advocate uh, for a, an alliance uh, in another uh, very allied nation, and, uh, and your voice carried extremely powerfully. Now, far less obvious, but perhaps far more important today, is the amazing role that Dr. Bruton played in the early stages of the peace process that we are so currently focused on through very, for various different reasons. And seen from this side of the Irish Sea, uh, that process should serve as a reminder that the UK's single most important foreign relationship is with the Republic of Ireland. And even though the Entente Cordiale is something particularly close to my heart and the special relationship is one that really did uh, underscore most of my military career, it is quite clear to me that the reason we went to Dublin as the first visit uh, of the Foreign Affairs Committee under my chairmanship was because we were very conscious of the absolute centrality of the relationship between Dublin and Westminster for the happiness and prosperity of our two peoples. Now, as we begin to uh, think about uh, the Catholic social teaching that uh, Dr. Bruton is going to talk to us about, I thought I'd bring up uh, something that actually I was part of earlier today. There was a series of surveys done in recent months for a think tank that I'm privileged to be on the board of called Onward that showed the disconnect between many young people and political life and the challenges that many political parties, mine of course in particular, have with attracting young people uh, to engage politically. And what was particularly striking was the desire for values, the desire for purpose in life that most people uh, really do feel and the engagement that young people in particular feel towards uh, a moral economy, a moral purpose in employment, and indeed uh, uh, an honourable reward, not a greed, but an honourable reward uh, for labours done and for efforts made. Now I think that uh, really does 
as you will see very shortly, I hope, um, introduce the thoughts that Dr. Bruchin is going to bring, because that underscoring of uh, political life is not just Catholic, but I would argue human, and Catholic social teaching uh, goes a long way to help us in that. So thank you very much indeed for allowing me to introduce Dr. Bruchin. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, Reverend Fathers, <clears throat> uh, Ambassador, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to say that I was daunted by the invitation to give this lecture would be something of an understatement. While I have some knowledge of political life, as Tom has just indicated, my study of Catholic social teaching has been rudimentary, or at least until this week. <laughs> <laughs> so I set to work and read for the first time in my life numerous of the documents of Vatican II. I also revisited some important papal encyclicals on Catholic social thinking. And I found a book published by the Catholic Truth Society entitled Catholic Social Teaching A Way In by Stratford Caldecott, a book that lives up to its title. It is indeed a way in to the subject that is lucidly written brief and accessible. In all this reading, I discovered something that shouldn't really have surprised me at all. Uh, although I'd not realized it at the time, Catholic social thought has influ influenced my views about political and social questions throughout my entire public life, all 50 years and more of it, as Tom has kindly <coughs> drawn to attention. Um, I will try to illustrate this uh, in this lecture, so forgive me if I am referring to myself rather more often than I would wish to do, but it is to illustrate a wider point about the influence, often unacknowledged and unseen, of Catholic uh, social thought, at least on this one, politician. Um, the extent to which Catholic social teaching influenced my politics uh, was not the result of abstract thought or personal study at the time of encyclicals, because I did neither of those things, but through day-to-day -day confrontation with difficult issues uh, using the Christian influence of the values that had been imbued in me by various other people, starting with my parents and my extended family, my teachers, Dominican nuns in Cabra, Dublin, Jesuit fathers in Clongos, and the priests of my parish in Dunboyne, and also Kilcloon, to whom I was probably listening a lot more than either they or they taught, but I was listening, and most importantly, and most recently, to my wife, Finola. Uh, I entered politics at the age of 18 when I joined Fine Gael in Dunboyne, political party uh, in 1965, September 1965. And I was elected to the Doyle 50 years ago um, at the age of 22 in 1969. Just as the conflict in Northern Ireland was beginning to, tra to be transformed from a peaceful struggle for civil rights, for people, into an unwinnable sectarian war concerning sovereignty over territory. Concern about something human and alive was re being replaced by conflict about something arid and theoretical. Argument was replaced by arson and by other deadly forms of violence. One of my earliest speeches in the Doyle in 1970 was in criticism of the alleged involvement of members of the then Irish government in the importation of arms for use by nationalists in Northern Ireland, an illegal and reckless endeavour. From the beginning, I was suspicious of the then prevailing attitude in the south of Ireland to the Northern Ireland issue. It was simply one-sided. Unionists wrong, nationalists right would be a fair summation of the attitude of mind that prevailed in Ireland in the late 60s and early 70s. 
And I realized quite early on that that approach, which typified our attitude, did not correspond with the Catholic idea that every human being has equal dignity with every other, be they unionist or nationalist, Catholic or Protestants. Nor did it correspond with the spirit of rational inquiry that had been encouraged by the education I'd been privileged to receive. The, the violence used by the nominally Catholic members of the IRA did not live up to the requirement of the Catholic catechism to the effect that the result of resorting to arms must not produce evils and disorder graver than the evil to be eliminated. The civil rights, the elimination of discrimination in housing, jobs, etc., had actually already largely been resolved before the campaign of violence of the IRA commenced. Their goal was a coerced United Ireland. The IRA campaign and the loyalist reaction to it did not constitute a just war. It did not meet the well-known criteria laid out, I think, by St. Thomas Aquinas for a just war. It did not meet these criteria. Put more simply, it was a breach of the Fifth Commandment. Its dire consequences were foreseeable and foreseen. Atrocity provoked atrocity in a cycle of pain. Trust was destroyed. It opened wounds that notwithstanding the passage of time and the conclusion of political agreements at a high level remain raw and painful to this day. Our fathers, we are enjoined to love God and to love your neighbour as yourself. More shockingly, we're even commanded to love our enemies. Our neighbour is all humankind. These are central concepts in our faith, to which I will return later in various different concepts, contexts in which they apply. In the case of Northern Ireland, our neighbour is the person living on the other side of the so-called peace line in Belfast. Loving one's neighbour is not a matter of mere sentiment. It's not a, a matter of feeling. To love one's neighbour, one has to go out of one's way to understand him or her, to understand how he or she sees the world, his or her politics, his or her deepest fears. Too many people in Northern Ireland today, on both sides, fail to make that effort and thus fail in their Christian obligation to love their neighbour. This failure is made too easy by the fact that the two communities attend different schools, as a result largely of a Catholic policy, and follow different sports and clubs, and I could go into that, it would take all evening, and of course frequently live but not always in different neighbourhoods. The Christian obligation to love one's neighbour derives from the understanding we have as Christians of what it is to be human, of the inherent dignity of every human being created by God. That global obligation to the entirety of mankind was always there in Catholic, church, in, in Catholic teaching, perhaps not always lived up to fully by the church, but it was always there. But it took on a new universality in the declarations of Vatican II on religious freedom and on relations with new non-Christians issued just after I left school in 1965. <coughs> I've no doubt that Vatican II shaped my thinking, albeit indirectly, because uh, I didn't read any of the documents at the time. On relations with non-Christians, Vatican II said, all peoples comprise a single community. It acknowledged the value of other religions. It says that these other religions, 
individually enumerated in that part of the Vatican II papers, are helping people who are searching for answers to questions <coughs> like, what is man? What is the meaning and purpose of our life? What is goodness and what is sin? What is truth? What is the truth about death, judgment, and retribution beyond the grave? These are the words of Vatican II describing not the Catholic Church and what it does, but what other religions do, <coughs> acknowledging their validity as well as ours. It goes on to say, the ground is removed from every theory or practice which leads to a distinction between men and people, men and peoples in the matter of human dignity and the rights which flow from it, end of quotation. As a consequence, the church reject, rejects, again quoting, as foreign to the mind of Christ, any discrimination against men or harassment of them because of their race, condition, life or religion. Bear in mind these words were written in 1965 when men was used as a noun to encompass men and women. I think if the Vatican II was rewritten today, would, that part might have been expressed differently, but the sentiment would have remained the same. This spirit of openness to others expressed in Vatican II echoed and was echoed by other developments in the secular world that were taking place at that time in the 60s the development of the European communities and moves towards political integration in Latin America and Africa, were each of them a reflection of that opening which Vatican II expressed vis-a-vis -vis other peoples and different people of different faiths and beliefs. Each of these developments, notably the European Union in my view, but others as well, were and are building blocks of the single community of peoples that was called for in Vatican II. Vatican II, well in the ahead of its most extreme expressions, recognized the globalization that was already underway even then in the 1960s. It said the world at that time was joined together more closely than ever by social, technical and cultural bonds. That joining together of the world is much more advanced now than it was then at the end of Vatican II. A world that is interdependent, if it is not to destroy itself by destructive competition or degradation of the national wor natural world, needs a common set of rules. It is only through a commonly agreed commonly interpreted and commonly, commonly enforced set of rules that we can really take back control of the world. This is recognized in many people in cyclists. Hence the support of the church for the growth, as I said, of multinational rule setting bodies like the WTO, the WHO, the IMF, the Bank of International Settlements, and of course the EU. The Church has given important guidance in this matter. The then Cardinal Ratzinger said in a phrase that, in my view, sums up better than any what the European Union is about when he said, it is the specific task of politics to apply the criterion of law to power. It's the no it is not the law the stronger, but the strength of the law that must hold sway. Very wise words in any context. One of my, digressing slightly, one of my first political interventions was in 1966, as far as, indeed, as, far as anything was concerned. And it concerned the then abortive attempt of the then Taoiseach Sean, uh, Jack Lynch, I think it was, um, to lead Ireland into the Euro European common market, as it then was. And in support of Mr. Lynch and others, um, I turned, turned up uninvited at a public meeting organised by Sinn Féin. 
that was before there was provisional Sinn Féin and official Sinn Féin, Kevin Street Sinn Féin and Garda Street Sinn Féin. There was just one Sinn Féin at that time in Navin, in the Central Hotel in Navin. And the meeting was chaired by a man, I knew this in advance, reputed to be the Chief of Staff of the IRA, Mr. Sean McStiffon, John Stevenson. Uh, he actually was born in England, but he was called Sean, he called himself Sean McStiffon. And he was chairing the meeting. And from the floor, uh, I challenged one of the platform speakers. I didn't disagree, didn't agree with him, with what he was saying about the common market. And there were people trying to stop me, and one man sort of started banging his walking streets and stick on the on the floor and saying the bullock for the road and the land for the people, which is a reference to my um, agricultural background, which uh, Francis will understand, I think. Um, but to my surprise, the chief of staff of the IRA insisted that I get a fair hearing, which I did. And then afterwards, I actually succeeded in getting my remarks printed in the local paper, the Mead Chronicle. So my political career was underway. So I can thank the European Union and Sean McStiffon for <laughs> launching me into politics. And that poor man has a lot to answer for. Anyway, coming back to a more uh, less anecdotal uh, reference, I know some sincere Catholics in this country will disagree with me. But I believed then, back in 1966, and I believe now that the work of bringing European nations together in peace in and through the European Union is, as a former colleague of mine, Joe McCartan, said to me once, the nearest thing in politics to God's work. I believe that. The European Union is a democratic, multinational rule maker. But it will not be held together by rules alone. Nor will any nation or society be held together by rules alone. There has to be a shared moral sense, a spirit of solidarity based on that, to give life and meaning to the rules, as Tom Tuckentas said in his introduction. That shared moral sense can cover things that cannot and should not be regulated by public authorities. Individualism and the promotion of individual rights is never enough. An individual can only achieve fulfillment by working for and with other people. My individual rights are nothing if other people are not there who are willing to spend their time and often their money to ensure that my rights are respected. That applies to every one of our rights. We need other people if we're to have any effective rights. As the then Cardinal Ratzinger put it, today we ought perhaps to amplify the doctrine of human rights with the doctrine of human obligations and human limitations. Just because we can does not mean that we should. Science may tell us what we can do, but it cannot tell us what we ought to do. Science cannot give birth to an ethos. That is something that religion does. Catholic social teaching reminds us of these things. Without getting directly into politics, the church can make a huge contribution to the well-being of the peoples of Europe and of the whole world by reminding people of their ethical responsibilities that go alongside their rights. The church can help so set the tone of society, which is, is as important as any law. It can remind people of the sense, deep in the conscience of all human beings, that there is an objective right and an objective wrong, that there are moral facts objective rights and responsibilities that are just as important as any scientifically uncovered empirical facts. This natural law, this moral sense, is there in all humans everywhere, of all faiths and none. And, the Catholic, teach and Catholic teaching is one way of uncovering it. 
It is that moral sense that makes us human. The examination of conscience is the door to the natural law that is within each of us. It is an exercise that assures et ethical behavior in business, sport, politics, and life. The examination of conscience precedes all law and is more effective than any external auditor. I don't know whether there's anyone from the big four here. I'm not trying to criticize them, but a conscience makes auditing less necessary. A lack of conscience sets an impossible task for auditors. This examination of conscience in business was never more necessary than it is today in a world beset within business by widening income inequalities, narrow, arid pursuit of shareholder value, and sometimes, of course, by scandals. Laws alone will never stop all abuse. Informed, muscular, and repeated examination of conscience can do so. That is what will build trust between people. And numerous studies have shown that a society in which there is mutual trust will be happier and more prosperous. It's perhaps interesting for us Catholics to reflect upon the fact that the country where the level of mutual trust is highest is actually a Lutheran country. It's Sweden. And in Europe, one of the countries which have least trust are some of the most Catholic. So perhaps we need to think about that, usually being the one I have in mind, but I didn't say that. <laughs> um, and a society is not a collection of social atoms held in check by government acting as some sort of mutual insurance policy for us all, which we pay a subscription called taxation. A society is, in fact, a set of overlapping communities with obligations to one another and trust between them. Returning to my own journey, I became Minister of Finance in 1981, at a time when the Irish state was on the brink of a financial abyss. Because of the coincidence of previous recklessly expansionary fiscal policy from 1977 by a government of a different complexion to mine, then followed by a deliberate and sudden hike in international interest rates undertaken by uh, the US Federal Reserve without any regard to the financial situation that Ireland was in. And this left us cruelly exposed, left me cruelly exposed more particularly. In face of this, I had to introduce some hard budgets increasing direct and indirect taxation. And I have to say that I did not find Catholic social thinking particularly helpful <laughs> in confronting this budget crisis. It was and remains rare to find church leaders pronouncing in favor of fiscal prudence or of matching ends with means, even though that is a moral as well as a political issue. The church advocates financial solidarity with the poor, particularly in times of fiscal crisis, which is right, but is often silent on the necessity for, for financial solidarity with future generations, which is the main argument for avoiding excessive accumulations of debts, deficits, and pension obligations, for which, for which future generations will have to pay. Too often, the church takes the easy route and leaves that particular moral question to politicians. Bishops have little to say about balancing the state's budget, even though they're probably quite good at balancing the budget in their own diocese. The church should apply to fiscal policy the same sense of intergenerational justice that it applies to environmental policy. The church is rightly eloquent about the fact that this generation is destroying the physical world for future generations. But the church should be equally concerned if politicians, through piling up unpayable pension obligations and debts, is destroying the financial as well as the environmental future of coming generations. The same logic applies to both. But the church is right to say that the market has limits 
And to me, indeed, a market can only exist if there are rules or limits. But rules are not enough. They can't cover everything. We also need trusts and ethics, phenomena that church teaching strengthens on a daily basis. Although I did have to introduce budgets that increased tax taxation dramatically in, in 1981, 82, and 1987, I'm pleased to say that I also introduced the largest ever increase uh, in pensions and benefits for the less well-off, a 25% increase in one year in 1982. Just putting that there for the record. Um, I also was able to introduce incentives for all workers in a firm to own shares in the business in which they work something advocated by Pope John XXIII in his encyclical matter at Magister. Unfortunately, this good concept of employee shareholding has been applied selectively in many firms. It has been used to give disproportionately large increases in remuneration through stock options to just a few employees at the very top of some large firms. And this works against the solidarity, sense of solidarity, that should exist among all working in an enterprise. It has enabled, over many years, the gap in remuneration, since 1980, essentially, to get wider and wider and wider within business, especially so in United States firms, less so in European firms. This, these so-called compensation policies are a deep structural flaw in modern capitalism that may eventually undermine the permissive consensus among the public upon which capitalism, in which I believe, depends. Returning to my personal narrative, uh, I, I became Taoiseach in 1994 as a result of the breakup of the previous coalition government. Coming to office without having had a general election immediately previously was a blessing. <laughs> I was able to take up the work of my predecessor without, without the burden of manifesto promises, which, as we see in the UK today, can be a constraint on common sense. <laughs> Looking back, it's fair to say that one highlight of my term of office was the agreement in 1995 with the UK Prime Minister, John Major, of a joint framework document agreeing the joint British and Irish approach to resolving the conflict in Northern Ireland. I'm going to dwell a little bit more than I might otherwise have done on this because it, its content has direct relevance to the political debate that's taking place today about backstops and Northern Ireland and borders and all of that. And I hope the story I will tell about what we did in 1995 will help illustrate where we have come from to get to where we are today. This framework document, which was agreed between the two governments, uh, three years later, became the Good Friday Agreement agreed not just between two governments, but between the governments and the political parties. It was slightly less elaborate and ambitious than the framework document between the between the governments, but the basic thinking, which I will outline in both, was the same. The framework document said, and John Major and I agreed this, that the two governments would, I quote, respect the full and equal legitimacy and worth of the identity, sense of allegiance, aspiration, and ethos of both unionist and nationalist communities in Northern Ireland. That was the basic principle. In return for this statement of equal, equal treatment of nationalism with unionism, on behalf of the Irish government, I agreed that we would change our constitution to remove Ireland's territorial claim on the territory of Northern Ireland, which was subsequently done in 1998. But that was to be done on the basis that we were maintaining the existing birthright of everyone born in either part of Ireland to be part of the Irish nation. That was the counterpart for the change in the Constitution, allowing people living in Belfast to be and feel as Irish as people living in Dublin, if that was what they wanted, but without any coercion and without them leaving the United Kingdom. That was the key. It made being in the United Kingdom and being Irish 
compatible. That was the key. To give effect to this birthright, we agreed to set up a detailed, detailed arrangements for North-South cooperation, uh, which would involve great deals of traffic and movement of people, ideas and goods and money between the two parts of Ireland, while Northern Ireland could still remain fully in the United Kingdom. The issue here was not about the, about the hardness of the border, but about mut ensuring mutual recognition and ease of cooperation between people. It was not about lines on a map or what happened when you crossed a line on the map, but about really making lines on the map no longer the relevant consideration. In the, two frame, in the framework document, therefore, to give effect to that, we agreed, John Major and I, that we would have executive level cooperation on infrastructure, marketing, and culture. And that we would have harmonization of laws and practices across agriculture and fisheries, industrial development, consumer affairs, transport, energy, trade, health, social welfare, and economic policy. I'm quoting directly from the framework document here. And this was to give effect to the commitment that I've just outlined about basically allowing people who lived in Northern Ireland to stay in the UK but still be Irish. Now it doesn't require a lot of insight when you think about the, what we were trying to achieve to see that Brexit creates a problem for this. Because Brexit involves the UK and Northern Ireland leaving the EU single market and thereby taking back the power to make potentially incompatible rules on all these topics in Northern Ireland from the ones that would apply in the European Union and in the rest of Ireland. Uh, it undermined completely the, under, the thinking that was expressed in great detail in the framework document, John Major, and I agreed, and which is an endorsed by the people in both parts of Ireland in the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. Brexit involves the dismantlement of a painfully constructed but still half-built structure of peace on the island of Ireland. The decision on Brexit was, I fear, undertaken without sufficient thought to the effect it would have on Britain's nearest neighbour. How do I relate this to Catholic social teaching? As I said earlier, to fulfill fill one's Christian duty of love of one's neighbour, one must go out of one's way to understand one's neighbour. To understand how he or she sees the world, his politics and his deepest fears. That's always usually hard work, but that's what love is. The obligation applies to nations just as it applies to statecraft just as it applies to individuals. As I said earlier, it is inconsistent with that duty of love, that duty of charity, to fail properly to consider the effect of one's actions on others, particularly on one's nearest neighbours, in statecraft or in personal life. It's important that the British people understand what they are doing by Brexit, and thus why there has to be a backstop. <coughs> Returning to my own narrative, and my time as party leader ended, I was fortunate enough to be appointed in 2002 as one of the representatives of Don Lairn <coughs> to the Convention on the Future of Europe, a body charged with revising the European Union <coughs> treaties. Uh, oh, thank you. <coughs> Sorry, this speech is longer than I thought it was going to be. I hope <laughs> I'm glad you're not standing up. Um, one of the ideas I promoted in the Convention was the inclusion in the treaties of a reference to belief in God as one of the sources of inspiration for the European Union, using a wording derived from the Polish Constitution. This was not acceptable uh, to the Liberal and Social Democrat members, and so had no majority. Another proposal, however, which did get support, which I supported, although I didn't originate it, some say it was originated in the Vatican, I don't know. 
was a proposal which is now in Article 17 of the Treaty. Uh, this article uh, recognises particularly the role of um, religious organisations and ethical communities, I think is the word that's used. It's pretty inclusive. But it says that the EU shall do nothing to interfere with national protections that may be given to religions or ethical associations by national law. In other words, EU law cannot be used to trump religious freedom and religious rights. Uh, and I'm glad to say that Article 17 has worked well and has been given life, uh, indeed life by an Irish member of the European Parliament who is the Parliament's representative from that, Mairead McGuinness. So those are three things. I'm not going to give a lecture on the Treaty of Lisbon, um, although it's fascinating. Uh, I think I've said enough about it. Um, in, in 2004, I was appointed to be ambassador to the European Union, of the European Union to the United States of America. Uh, one of the people behind that was Lord Patton of Barnes, my very good friend to whom I owe a great deal, Chris Patton. Um, the United States is very different. Who am I telling this to? The United States is very different from Europe. The vast majority of the population of the United States are the descendants of recent immigrants. Now, I, I say recent, I mean three generations or four generations, because that is recent in humankind. The vast majority of Americans are essentially the descendants of, of immigrants who arrived often friendless and lonely in a strange land. The sense of rootedness that we here on this side of the Atlantic take for granted has had to be constructed anew in the United States from scratch. This explains perhaps the brashness of American culture, at least in our eyes, but it also explains the religiosity of Americans. And this is because churches provided at then and continue to provide now a focus for community and a focus for setting down of roots for Americans in a form that isn't necessary, to a degree that isn't necessary for Europeans who already take their roots perhaps too much for, for granted. But that work of community building exemplified so well by the activity of churches in America is work that is increasingly going to be needed all over the world. As the world, world becomes more urbanized, people are living far away from their parents and in-laws and relatives, living frequently at lone and lonely lives in big cities, lonely in a crowd. And I'll illustrate that by some reference to the content of the Global Risks Report of the World Economic Forum. It says, and this is directly related, I think, to the phenomenon of urbanization and its ills, that mental health problems affect 700 million people in the world today. It says that since 1990, depression has increased by 54% and anxiety disorders by 42%. And that this is an especial problem among young people and young males in particular. It seems to be linked to materialism. I also believe it's associated with loneliness. Referring to materialism as a, a disorder, the report says that in one US study, 81% of 18 to 25 year olds said that getting rich was their generation's top or second from top goal. 81% of 18 to 25 year olds as against 62% of 26 to 39 year olds. But the younger you are, it would appear, the more materialistically disordered you are. It also refers the report to increased stress factors in young people's lives, violence, poverty, and loneliness. 22% of people here in the United Kingdom say they feel lonely, either sometimes, often, or always. In the United States, people report having fewer close friends on average. 2.1 friends in 2013, as against 2.9 friends 
1985. It's a sort of ch chilling trend. Uh, living alone uh, is associated with urbanization. Solitary living has reached 60% in Stockholm, 50% in Paris, and 94% in Midtown Manhattan, living alone. And loneliness, which is related to that, I think, is associated with poorer sleep quality and thus less personal resilience in the face of the challenges of daily life. Meanwhile, use of the social media has led to declines in empathy, empathy being the ability to put oneself in the shoes of another. And indeed, looking forward, techn technology may begin to devalue work as a means of developing self-worth. And I think these are the social phenomena that explain what Tom Tugendhat referred to earlier, of the searching that younger people have now for some sort of moral standard, some sort of demands to which they must give a response in their lives, to draw them out of this. Um, the latest edition of the Atlantic Monthly, and I think it's the current edition, um, suggests that among 18 to 35 year olds in the United States, self-assessed happiness has declined most dramatically amongst males. This happiness recession is associated, among other things, with a decline in the rate of marriage and a decline in religious attendance. Less happy, less married, less likely to go to church. Married young adults, in contrast, are 75% more likely to report that they are very happy compared with their peers who are not married. And mean, the share of adults between uh, 25 and 38 who are married has fallen from 59% to 28, from, 50, from 59% in 1972 to 28% today. So there's a connection between those phenomena. The decline, the decline in happiness is also associated with the decline in religious involvement. Young American adults who attend a religious service at least once a month are 40% more likely to say that they are happy than those who do not. Religious attendance among young adults, of course, has fallen since 1972 from 38% to 27%. The conjunction of those two trends, I think, suggests that there is a link. How can the church answer and deal with these problems of the modern world? At its most minimal, the church offers a sense of belonging, an antidote to loneliness through participation in religious services and activities. Even if it's only involved, involves commenting on the quality of the sermon or the singing or whatever it was, it is something that we have experienced in common and that draws us together, and we should not underestimate any of those things. <coughs> People are drawn together through religious practice. Um, but more importantly, religious practice offers us, us all, and I think the young generation that I've just referred to need this more than most, a sense of the value of each human life, from conception to natural death. And in so doing, it offers us all a rational sense, a rational basis for keeping a sense of proportion about contemporary problems that we may face in light of our eternal destiny. That certainly keeps things in proportion. It also helps us to put suffering and setbacks in their proper context and not to obsess about them. We must not be consumed by the things of this world or by our own short lives. Most importantly, the message of the resurrection is absolutely essential to our faith. Christ died and rose again so that we may live eternally. That's it. Well, I, 
I think I can speak for everybody when I say that, Dr. Bruton, if that's what you can do in a week, imagine what you could have done with a month. <laughs> Replace the entire faculty with one professor. There you go. There's a cost saving measure. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm, gonna, I'm going to take, uh, before, before I start asking questions, because this is an examined session, so it's not you who asked the question, we're going to throw them at you and you have to respond. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Before I start accepting questions for, for Dr. Bruton, I was just going to, if I may, completely abuse the position. Um, there were several moments there that really touched me. The first was Cardinal Ratzinger's comments on politics, I thought were uh, the then Cardinal Ratzinger's comments on politics, which I thought were phenomenal, and I could see another fellow politician, in fact, several fellow politicians in the, in the audience looking at me, that the criteria of politics is to apply law to power. I thought that was an incredibly powerful uh, way of reflecting on what our role truly is. And I also was very touched by your views on universality and uh, the Vatican II concept of the equality of humankind throughout the world. And I just wonder whether, uh, if I may, uh, perhaps slightly teasingly, question whether that universality uh, is not now wider uh, than the EU and is indeed a truly global concept that we should be aspiring to, uh, and maybe it's reflected through uh, organizations like Facebook or Google as much as it is through sovereign governments. I, I, I think, um what we are seeing now is that organizations like Facebook uh, also need to be subject to rules so that the men's decision that they offer is not a source of abuse on the other people. And to be able to apply rules to an entity as large as Facebook, you have to be large yourself. And the United States government is large enough control Facebook if it wanted to. But the European Union is the only entity in Europe that's large enough, I think, to be able to do that on a Europe-wide scale anyway, and that has the weight that can um, ensure that this idea of subjecting power to rules uh, applies in the space in which we work. So that's, but yes, to answer your opponent, I think we do have much wider obligations to the rest of the world than we have to Europe. Our continent, our wealthy, aging continent, we have tremendous obligations, particularly to those parts of the world in which Europeans have, shall we say, inserted themselves. And, uh, I don't exempt Irish people <coughs> from this because we were uh, actively involved in the building of the British Empire. We don't often talk about that, but it's true. Uh, and you know, therefore, we and you and other European countries have an obligation, particularly to lift up those who may have uh, treated not, not at all times equally fairly in the past. So yes, universality is universal; it's not confined to this country. Now, who can I ask to start off the questions? There you go. Literally answered every question. No, sorry, God. Madam, I'll ask you to go first, if I may. There's, I think there's a microphone coming. Would you care to introduce yourself before? Sorry. Yeah. A, um. Thank you. My name's Erica Wolf, and I have to admit to being an Anglican interloper. Um, I'm a vicar in South London. Um, I very much enjoyed your lecture, Dr. Britton, and I agree with it all. Um, my question is... Um, well, the Church of England is um, tying itself in knots, including in my parish, on how to, as we put it, attract millennials, which um, you touched on in, in the last part. Um, my question is, it seems to me from what you're saying to be more a matter of education of individuals, whatever their age group and wherever they sit, how do you do that in an attractive way that allows um, people to stop and hear ab about conscience and empathy and belonging amongst the maelstrom of opinion that we're all presented with? Well, I suppose we, we have all to accept uh, 
that we're evangelists in some sense or other. In other words, we shouldn't be ashamed to talk about these deeper things of uh, faith and the meaning of life and so on. Now, we in, in, in Ireland, I think, are particularly reticent about doing that. People in the United States are not. The people in the United States are much more free and clearly what they believe. But I think we must be more brave, all of us. I don't think it can be us left to be like you know, vicars or priests. It's, it's a responsibility of everybody. Uh, 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 and obviously, we must use modern media that are available, Facebook and all, all of those things, uh, to draw to people's attention things that might make them think. And I suppose you never know things that make you think will not, will, will, will not be the most obvious things. It will be something that you heard, overheard somebody say, or something like that. Something you might overhear somebody say in the supermarket. will make you think about something that could be a path for you back into, into the connection uh, to Christ and to church. Um, so uh, we just have to keep bearing with us. I don't think everything the to say. It's been said a million times by others, but it's still true. So there's a gentleman in the back, and then there's a, a lady over there too. Uh, thank you, Christopher Wild, uh, Senior Lecturer in Politics and International Relations at St. Mary's University. I was fascinated by some of your earlier comments about the relationship between Catholic social teaching and globalization, and the sense of community and how one associates and love thy neighbour and how that's associated with general support for the neoliberal institutional architecture in the form of the WTO, the IMF, and the World Bank. I'm very into my question is I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on the inevitable tensions between support for these kinds of institutions and their role in pushing things like global inequality through unfair trade practices, debt, and the inexorable hegemony of the liberal self and the associated loneliness that you spoke about? Well, I'm not sure that the institutions themselves promote uh, any of those things. It's the people who operate the institutions that promote them. I, I can't imagine a word as interdependent as Day, uh, functioning without a World Health Organization, without an international monetary fund of some kind, or without regional organizations like the European Union or um, the various other African Union and so, and so on. These institutions are essential if we're to live in, in a very interdependent world without colliding with one another or destroying the world. It's the people and what they do. Now, I, 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 and I refer to this in my speech. I think there is a problem uh, in, in capitalism, which I support, as I said, that it is very monomaniacal in pursuing shareholder value. Uh, and that's regarded as the only criterion of success, in, not in theory, but in practice. In theory, there's corporate social responsibility and there's you know, engagement with the community and all that, but if it isn't reflected in the bottom line, it doesn't count. Now, how do you change that? I don't know. <coughs> I don't think we can afford to or should attempt to abolish um, free enterprise. I, I think it's there. It has, brought, it has brought whatever number of billions of people out of poverty in the last 20 years, particularly in, in, in Asia. Uh, and it's been Good. But we need to, to mitigate it, and we can mitigate it through rules, global rules, whether they be on taxation and things like that. And these institutions, the OECD, may be useful in that regard. Uh, but also, we can mitigate it by people acting in a modern way uh, in all of the institutions and in the businesses. We can't, uh, we can't pass off the responsibility to institutions, it's a personal responsibility as well. As um, Dr. Catherine Cowley, I would like to um, pick up on three key categories of Catholic social teaching 
which I believe are also fundamental to a healthy political life. And those three are solidarity, subsidiarity, at the service of the common good. Um, and it seems to me that those are, are central to any sensible political agenda. And one finds subsidiarity and solidarity mentioned in the EU founding documents, so they go back a very long way. And I was wondering whether you were of the opinion that it's um, the way in which we have lost sight of those key principles, which is uh, a significant contributory factor to the polarization and hostility of so much contemporary political discourse. Well, I don't think we have lost sight of uh, solidarity, as Angela Merkel has pointed out many times. Uh, we have, you know, this is 8% of the world's population, and we have maybe, um, I don't know the figures now, but 30 or 40% in Europe of social spending. So there's more solidarity in a financial sense in Europe than there is in the two governments at least. But to some extent what has happened in Europe is that government has taken over the responsibility that is exercised in other countries by extended families. In Asia, uh, the family looks after one another and its members, even to out to quite a distant degree of relationship. So what we've seen in the development of the social state in Europe is the state taking over the responsibility in the so for many social services that families exercise in less developed societies. Uh, now, but I do think solidarity is recognized in, in, in this continent. Maybe a little bit more than it is in North America, but it is represented in this continent. I don't think we're failing on that in, in, in general. There are people who fall through the cracks. There are issues that you know, need to be attended to. Subsidiarity, I have to say, I have always found it hard to define it in an operational sense. It's a phrase that's used very often by people who don't want to do something. And they say that should be left to subsidiary bodies. But then very often, perhaps, the subsidiary bodies don't do it. Um, I also think it's not a legal concept. It's a, it's a philosophical problem, or is it philosophical? It's, a, it's an idea rather than a, a law or a rule. And I, 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 I sort of have to say what I believe that the state should not arrogate to itself things that families uh, should be doing. Uh, identifying what is the body that can actually do what can be done at a level closer to the person than the state. That's not always easy and therefore subsidiarity as a concept I personally have never found to be particularly useful in practice as a practical politician. Um, Few more. There's a lady here, Philip, at the front. Um, should we take them in twos? And, uh, maybe, and then I can see you two gentlemen as well. So uh, this this lady here. Henrietta Royal. I'm afraid I'm not on the internet. <laughs> um, Dr. Bruton, you mentioned uh, briefly in a, a, an answer to another question about the nervousness in Europe about talking about faith from leading politicians. We do have in our current Prime Minister someone who is upfront about that and indeed, uh, and then prior to that, Tony Blair sort of wobbled. Sometimes he clearly would like to but was told very firmly that um, by some of his political advisors we don't do God, rather famously. Why do you think it is that politicians in Europe find it so difficult? And, and, and why is it that actually there is, seems to be a huge suspicion about people who 
talk about faith informing their values and what can be done to make people more comfortable with that, whether politicians to admit it or the general public and the media to be not see it as, you know, these are just going to be Neanderthals going around saying that everybody's socially and ghastly and they're all going to control us for in Saudi Arabia. Philip, you were going to... <coughs> Thank you. Um, Philip Booth, Professor of Finance, Public Policy and Ethics at St. Mary's. Um, you mentioned government debt and, um, and public pensions uh, obligations and this sort of thing, which practicing politicians like to brush under the carpet and leave for the next lot to deal with. And the three of us in this room, as it happens, we're sitting <coughs> a PhD on Catholic social teaching and uh, in relation to that issue. And I'm just wondering what you think will happen over the next 30 years in, um, in the European Union and elsewhere, in Asia too, as these obligations crystallise. Because you're, you're talking about you know, um, uh, uh, government debts and public pension liabilities and this type of thing of the order of about 400% of national income in many cases. That's a, it's a problem which we've really never seen before, uh, combined with demographic decline and, and the uh, fall in the relative size of the taxpaying population. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> those are two good questions. Uh, on the first one, I, I think politicians are afraid to speak out their faith because they're afraid of losing votes. And they're wrong, I think. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, Theresa May has achieved by is to prove that they're wrong. But because while she has been the subject of criticism and has lost support, it has not become, been because she is seen at church every Sunday. On the contrary, I think, uh, that probably has mitigated some of the criticism that she might otherwise have been uh, the victim of. Um, and I think she has done, done a great good in that regard. Um, now, there are reasons, of course, for the reticence. Um, in Ireland, the Catholic Church completely overreached itself in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s in terms of the influence it sought to exercise on public life. And there has been and continues to be a reaction against that, which probably makes it more difficult for people to talk uh, favorably about religious influences because religious influences objectively in some cases went too far and are seen by others to have gone too far to a degree that's not a um, I, I think that's that's all that I, I, I say about that. I think Theresa May has done, has done the job that needs to be done as far as concerned. Um, as far as the other question is, is concerned, um, yes, uh, I've been aware of the reports that have been produced uh, which show that we were to continue with current economic and social policies with less pension obligations and with uh, you know, the low birth rates and uh, high longevity that exists in many Western countries that if we were not to change policies we would reach uh, debt level, debt rates as 500% of GDP. Interestingly enough, the country that has done most about mitigating that is Italy, a country that you know, one doesn't normally associate with far-sighted prudence, but in fact they have reformed their pensions in ways that we have not done in the rest of the European Union. So we may have to follow there. Changing the basis of calculation of pensions. But it behoves those who do enjoy triple lock secured pensions that, to bear in mind that they have a responsibility to the young people who want to have to pay those in the future uh, in the decisions that they make and will going for that. Um, I, 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 I think this has been flagged so well. Uh, it is true that politicians will leave it to the last minute to do something about it. Uh, I think we will probably have a vote on inflation. I think inflation may solve the problem in the sense that the pensions will 
not be increased in line with with inflation. And debts will be inflated away I, 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 sometime in the next 25 or 30 or 40 years. I think that's the way the problem has been resolved. That's our problem that's been resolved in the past. Half of all, remember, we fought huge wars, which were even more expensive than the pension bond. And how do we deal with them? We dealt with them by inflation. Uh, I, I think that's, you know, that's what we're stuck with stories to bring. Uh, a lot of inflation. Well, we're running out of time, so forgive me. I'm going to go to what, one last question. I'm going to go to, sorry, I do apologize. I'm going to go to Gisela, who has been uh, who is a, a very dear friend, and this is complete bias, so forgive me. It's a, <laughs> a totally outrageous. Yeah, it's I'm, I'm not across the internet, but I'm here to have the charity. You claim to have made the person who's there to laugh at when I talked to him. We arrived as a, a delegation of British parliamentarians, and I started speaking to him with Paul this Bavarian accent, which you probably last heard before I speak. <laughs> I just want to take you back to the Constitutional Convention. And I remember a session where it was the Foreign Office briefing of one of our ministers, and one of the Foreign Office guys said, oh, this is a typical European teleological argument, which the British minister said, what do you mean by a teleological argument? And he said, oh, the Catholic Europeans think there's such a thing as a right answer. And you don't need to talk about it long enough to find it. We are Anglo Saxons, we know there's only an appropriate answer, not a right answer. <laughs> and I just, just wonder is this, this, this Catholic heretic in this Protestant country where they get sworn in as a privy council, the Catholics still come last. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's Church of England first, Jews, Muslims, and then the Catholics. <laughs> um, it, isn't the debate much deeper than you know, when we talk about Theresa May's faith, it is a kind of Protestant faith. And what really divides us is that you and I being brought to the Catholic Church, we, we think there's a right answer. Most of the UK doesn't think there's a right answer. They think there's an answer which fits the moment. And that really divides us. Well, He's a, that's a good question. He's <laughs> <laughs> um, as, as some of you will know, served with me representing national parliaments in the Convention on Future Europe. She represented the Socialists and the Party, and I represented the European People's Party. Um, so we know one another very well, and I admire her greatly. Um, I, I, I'm going to give a facetious answer, but it's not really as facetious as. I think, this, I don't know whether this is true. Uh, I certainly haven't read any books about it. I think the difference between the Catholic approach to these great questions and the Protestant approach and the more limited, less ambitious appropriateness that is the test in the, in the, in, in the reform churches and the more idealistic there is a right answer approach that we in the Catholic uh, tradition uh, adopt. I, I think you know, you're not wrong at all, I agree with you. I think the key to it is confession. Uh, we set ourselves very high ideals and we then have a means of being shriven and coming out and having all those sins wiped away. So we, it's easier for us to have high ideals and to fail because we have this mechanism that's there to help us um, forget about our failure, or at least to put it back in context. Whereas the absence of something of that nature, perhaps in some other things, uh, is an issue. Oh, I'm, not, I'm treading on very uh, dangerous ground here because I see a thicker looking at me. <laughs> what is she thinking about what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get hammered in here. Anyway, that's my explanation of it. It is not a prepared answer. It's almost certainly wrong. Well, look, can I thank, uh, thank you enormously, Dr. Bruton, but it's not for me to thank, thank you. I'm going to ask uh, His Excellency Adrian O'Neill, the Ambassador of the Republic of Ireland, to say a few words. And then uh, Father Jim will get close to us. Okay. 
Uh, thank you, Tom, um, Reverend Fathers, uh, John. Uh, I won't keep you very long. Um, just to say, when I got the invitation last week from Francis to attend this lecture by Dr. Bruton on uh, Catholic social thought, I thought to myself, well, should it be a nice respite from Brexit? Um, but uh, so I suppose my expectations in that regard weren't entirely validated. But nonetheless, John, I want to uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I suppose um, I was uh, at a, a lecture here in London uh, about a week ago by um, former President of Ireland Mary Robinson on the issue of, of climate justice, um, and she was telling a story about uh, Bishop. Desmond Tutu once, who she was with, I think, in New York, and they were speaking on a, a platform together, and he was speaking in um, very uplifting, positive, idealistic terms, uh, and I think the, the moderator uh, kind of challenged him and said, you know, how come, you know, how come you're such an optimist? Uh, and he said, oh, no, I'm, I'm not an optimist. I'm just a prisoner of hope. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I think I've been thinking about that a lot these days. Um, particularly over recent weeks, um, and the need, uh, despite the challenges that are there um, uh, on the issue that John spoke about in terms of Brexit, uh, that we, you know, we all continue to be uh, prisoners of hope. And uh, in that regard, uh, I just want to say that you know, when, we look, when we look back uh, on the life and record uh, of John Bruton as a, uh, as, a, as a politician, as a minister, as a Taoiseach, uh, as a ambassador, a very distinguished ambassador of the European Union uh, in the United States, it uh, gives me certainly a great sense uh, of hope and inspiration. Um, and, and one of the things that has always characterised John's career, I think, has been, you know, he is he is a conviction politician. He is a man of great courage. Uh, he speaks out, and he speaks out against the grain often uh, of, of orthodox thinking, uh, as he did uh, here again uh, this evening. And when I look to the future uh, as well, um, what gives me hope in terms of the future of politics um, is someone like Tom Chugan had. Um, because I think Tom, as he mentioned, I met Tom very early on after coming to London. Um, uh, and not too long after he assumed the role as, as, as chairman uh, of the Foreign Relations Committee uh, in the Parliament. And uh, he spoke to me very convincingly and with great, with great conviction as well about the, really imp the, the importance of the relationship between our two countries, and not just mediated through our shared responsibility in Northern Ireland, but as two countries uh, who, in terms of our uh, interdependency and in terms of our mutuality, there is, so there is in a, it's a really important strategic relationship uh, for both countries. And I was so encouraged and inspired by that, by that analysis uh, and Tom, just please keep it up. And John, thank you. You too, keep it up. Please, please keep challenging us. Um, I think President Michael D. Higgins, uh, his, his, uh, his, his recent book of speeches, I think, is called Ideas Matter, and they do. And I think people uh, like John, who keep bringing those ideas and keep challenging us to think more broadly and deeply, I think really enrich our public life uh, on both parts uh, of the Irish Sea. So thank you both uh, for this evening. Thank you very much to St Mary's for giving us this, this opportunity uh, and forum. And uh, thank you. Good evening. Admittedly, I could have stayed at my seat, but when a priest or vicar sees a, something that looks like a pulpit, we're inclined to use it. <laughs> now, I don't know how many of you know that the University of Notre Dame in the US, it, this site is our home site, and we bring over 140 undergraduates each semester uh, to uh, sort of immerse themselves in, in the, the life of London and, and, and the environs beyond. Um, we are called, though, the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. And that's a, a long history. For some reason, we're not called the Fighting English. We have a history with the English. It's complicated. But uh, we're called the Fighting Irish, even though in 1842 we were founded by a French priest. Hence our name, the University of Notre Dame. We sort of bastardized the French. But we had a bunch of kids after the potato famine in the late 40s who found their way to Chicago, families. And they sent their immigrant children, their children, to our, our upstart institution at Notre Dame, about an hour and a half from Chicago. And they were a bunch of roughnecks, I should tell you. And we played football, but they, they as an insult to them, we were the ramblers. But no, the people we played called us 
the fighting Irish because they were Irish and they were fighters. And we took it on proudly for some reason. So ever after, we've been known as the Fighting Irish, and we're rather proud of it. I will just end with words that are um, more, I mean, quite rightly a prayer. We'll sneak a prayer in every chance we get around these parts. And so I'm going to end with a benediction of sorts just to ask a blessing on, on our gathering. And, and, and thanks to, to, to John Pruton and to our esteemed colleagues. I especially thank St. Mary's and and Ashley and Francis and Ruth. Let's bow our heads and just acknowledge God in our, in our midst. Fill the hearts of those who have joined with us today with the zeal that Dr. Bruton articulates, that we might live lives of purpose and lives of courage and compassion, thinking not first of ourselves, but of those who are most in need, those for whom Jesus asked us to give particular attention and care and to honor the human dignity in all life, and that nations and neighbors take up their obligations as defenders of justice and democracy and religious freedom. As representatives, many of us from St. Mary's University and the University of Notre Dame, we ask you, O oh God, to look after our students and bless them with all the blessings that you can muster. And finally, O oh God, bless every member of the administration, faculty, and staff of our respective institutions, as well as those gathered here, our friends and benefactors, and all whose wit and wisdom and effort make possible that our students take away great blessings, memories, knowledge, and hope from their time with us. May all who have given their lives and their work to the mission and ministry of our institutions continue to be a source of inspiration and transformation for all who find their way to us. For the many for whom it matters so much, O oh God, may there always be a desire and a passion in our efforts to make you known and loved and served. May we continue to work together to educate the heart and the mind of every member of our respective communities and work together to build your kingdom on earth and may your gracious spirit, O oh God, enable the work of resurrection in us so that all of us might bring light and hope to a world so much in need of it and care and love to those who would suffer without it. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now I ask Father Ashley Beck to offer a um, token of thanks to our presenters in his way. Uh, we're very grateful to... John and Finola for coming this evening and now we have small gifts to give them. With that, we conclude our events for the evening, but there is a brief reception of uh, in the space beyond us in the corner of this room. So thank you again, and we're so grateful for your presence here.